dude, your, your page just kills me. It entertains me like constantly. I, I just, I, 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 <laughs> I, I watch your Instagram page for as much the entertainment value as the information value. So I want to commend you on that. It's just been a, a long road of comedy, man. I, I really, I really appreciate it. So. Well, I don't have, I can't, I don't look very good in a bikini. So you gotta, you gotta get, you know, you gotta get eyes on somehow. And so, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to, trying to hopefully help people one way or the other, whether we agree with what or not. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Okay, Alan. There we go. Hey, welcome. Hey, thanks. What's Alan. up? What's up, guys? Hey, it's uh, it's 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 good to good to get to chat with you. Um, for uh, those who don't know, I, Alan, well, Alan, I'll let you describe your background, but you've been a wealth of information over the years around nutrition and fitness, and I really enjoy uh, some of the stuff you put out there. So thank you, thank you for uh, taking the time to do this. I know you got a new book that's coming out, or it has come out, or something like that. So we probably mm -hmm. want to discuss that, but. For those that aren't familiar with you, would you just kind of let folks know your background, Alan? Sure. I am mainly known for my research in uh, sports and body composition related nutrition. And the, my research career started in 2013 uh, when a friend of mine named Brad Schoenfeld uh, pulled me onto a project where we took a harder look at the whole post exercise anabolic window concept and how it was being applied to mainly to, to hypertrophy goals and, and, and bodybuilding related goals and how it was actually being somewhat misapplied. So, so that's, that's kind of my, I guess what, what I'm most known for in the uh, sports nutrition research realm was the whole looking at the anabolic window. Then we kind of uh, moved on to looking at how protein distribution across the course of the day in terms of doses and timing, how that might impact hypertrophy. So that, that's uh, my impact in the research world and just sports nutrition in general. And prior to that, um, I guess I'm, I'm mainly known for being one of the first guys to bring in an evidence-based or research-based approach to the nutrition sphere. So that's, that's me in a nutshell, Sean. And and I applaud you for that. And it's difficult. I mean, you know, doing research on humans is a tough, tough task and, and you know, try to figure out all the different variables and all the different nuances out there. But let me, because I get a lot of questions about this, about, you know, about this anabolic window. It used to be, you know, because everybody's rushing out to slam 30 grams of protein and, you know, their, their carbohydrate to spike their insulin within 15 minutes of working out or the workout was wasted. I, I, you know, what is what does the science say about that now? What is the anabolic window? I mean, since you're the obviously one of the leading world's experts on us. I've had discussion with Don Lehman about this stuff in the past, which I, he has an interesting perspective as well. What does what your research show or what the research show, I suppose? Yeah. Yeah. Well, before I get into that, we, we got into this so, so quickly and stuff. I didn't get a chance to thank you for having me on. And uh, I didn't get a chance to say that, <laughs> dude, your, your page just kills me. It entertains me like constantly. I, I just, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I, I watch your Instagram page for as much the entertainment value as the information value. So I want to commend you on that. It's just been a, a long road of comedy, man. I, I really, I really appreciate it. So. Well, I don't have, I can't, I don't look very good in a bikini. So you gotta, you gotta get, you know, you gotta get eyes on somehow. And so, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to trying to hopefully help people one way or the other, whether we agree with what or not. But yeah, yeah I get it. I get so. it. Anyway, so yeah, and, and of course, of course, thanks for inviting me on it. And, and it is a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, are we live? Like, is, is the we're the, rolling, uh, man? This is all you all. So don't pick your nose or anything like that. We're good. <laughs> that That's awesome. So, okay. The anabolic window concept, I have to give it a, a little bit of background uh, for the listeners. And so it's the idea that you have about 30 to 60 minutes to get some nutrients in post exercise in order to kickstart muscle recovery and muscle growth. And so that was the idea put forth by John Ivey and Robert Portman. Um, and they, the, the research on that started in the late eighties. And this was on um, endurance applications where they would take overnight fasted subjects, put them through a glycogen depletion protocol, where they would 
run them for like 90 to 120 minutes and just tap out glycogen in the quads. And they would compare um, the consumption of a sizable amount of carbohydrate immediately post-exercise versus waiting two hours, let's say, to have the post-exercise carbohydrate. And then they would measure glycogen resynthesis over over several hours post-exercise. And so maybe maybe not too uh, surprisingly, they found a much greater rate of glycogen restocking uh, when you don't wait to have carbohydrate post-exercise. And so, okay, so that's fine for um, endurance competition applications. But what happened was they started testing the effect of protein post-exercise on muscle protein synthesis. So muscle protein synthesis for, for the listeners who might not be aware, it's a short term index of, of, of white, of what might uh, indicate muscle growth in the longer term. Okay. So it's sort of one of the, our short term proxies for, for the anabolic or the, or the muscle growth effect. And so with muscle protein synthesis, they, they also found that if you have protein immediately post-exercise versus delaying it. Um, and also if you have protein plus carbohydrate immediately post-exercise versus delaying it an hour or two or three, then you have a higher spike in muscle protein synthesis. Now, the problem with these early studies back in the um, late 90s, early 2000s, is that they use small amounts of they use small doses of protein post-exercise to compare the effects. And as the years wore on, um, they actually used higher doses of protein, like 20, 20, 25 grams and up. And they compared the timing of that with uh, the timing of that post-exercise. And they also compared protein with carbs and protein without carbs. They did all kinds of permutations of, of um, nutrient timing post-exercise. And they found that as long as you had a minimum of about 20 to 25 grams of protein post-exercise, it didn't matter whether you had that with carbohydrate or without carbohydrate. It, the, the muscle protein synthesis effect was the same once you hit a certain dosing threshold of protein post-exercise. Okay. So now with that short-term immediate post-exercise research out of the way, more studies started rolling in that actually measured muscle growth and strength over a period of weeks and months. And they compared different timing schemes, post-exercise delayed or post-exercise immediate, et cetera. And, you know, the whole anabolic window concept really did begin to crumble when you simply got enough protein in by the end of the day. And so my colleagues and I, we did a meta-analysis. So we, we did a study of the studies, so to speak, we pull the, the data of the studies together to see whether there was a meaningful effect of having protein immediately post-exercise versus neglecting protein post-exercise or pre-exercise after, um, after a two-hour lag. You know what, man, we, we found no meaningful effect of uh, different positions of, of protein or around the workout as long as protein was about 1.6 to 1.7 grams per kilogram, which is about 0.7 ish grams per pound of body weight and, and up. So most of our research, not on purpose, found out that the anabolic window concept was way overblown. So there's that story. Yeah, I talked to, I think I remember talking to Stu Phillips about, you know, th there's a minimal insulin threshold that is reached by protein carbohydrates don't really add any value to that once you hit that like you said 25 grams and i'm sure it's per, it's probably weighted per size of the person i mean i can't imagine a 100 pound female is going to need the same as a 250 pound you know bodybuilder yep. as far as you know what, what's going to go on there but there are some you know thoughts about you know partitioning your protein throughout the day like like for instance for me i mean i sit down there and like throw down two pounds of steak and now there's no research really on that because most of the research has been on isolates and whey proteins and has different absorption characteristics and no one's really studying what happens these guys are eating you know like a lot of these bodybuilders are putting down four or five pounds of animal protein a day it's it, did we, is it fair to say we don't have a lot of research on those on that those exact circumstances 
Oh man. Yeah. You don't know how much I love this question. <laughs> so <Okay>. um, <clears throat> I think that with protein dosing distribution through the day, like you're talking about, you gave the example of you eating two pounds of protein in a single sitting, which reminds me of myself at a Brazilian uh, barbecue right, right, yeah, joint, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, okay. So, so here's the theory and, and I am going to call it a theory or a hypothesis because you're right there. There just isn't the research rooting this out objectively. So in theory, uh, maximizing muscle growth is really a, it's really a game of how high can you spike muscle protein in, protein synthesis per meal. And since there appears to be a limit of how high you can spike muscle protein synthesis per meal, then your the, the objective would be to get those micro anabolic effects or those maximal MPS spikes get as many of them within a day as, as would max out the growth response overall. And so when we look at individual meals, like what amount of protein, wh where does muscle protein synthesis plateau? It appears to be somewhere, you know, conservatively, um, about 30 ish. Uh, and in some older folks, some older outliers, um, 50 ish grams of protein per meal. So that's maxing out muscle protein synthesis. Now, the problem with muscle protein synthesis is that it's just a part of the puzzle. It's, it's pretty dang difficult to measure it over the long term, um, unless you use something like deuterium oxide. And, and it's certainly, it's hard to, uh, measure net muscle protein balance, which is the balance between muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown. So that's why there's this gray area in our knowledge. Okay. So in theory, if you if your goal was to maximize muscle growth, then you would have multiple doses of protein per day to the tune of about on the low end, like three to four. So hypothetically, um, and, and that's because of a bunch of different, uh, bunch of different puzzle pieces that give us the hypothesis that you would need to do that. Okay. So setting that aside, setting the goal of muscle growth aside, the goal of retaining muscle while you're dieting appears to be a whole different animal because there's a lot of research on people eating very low meal frequency per day and just slamming a bunch of protein down in one to two meals a day. Um, and retaining their muscle just fine, even when they're eating like <laughs> every other day. And you got these 24 hour periods of no intake and people's muscles aren't falling off their bones. So for the goal of, of muscle retention while losing fat, it appears that meal frequency and, and just the, the dosing and distribution of protein through the day, it doesn't matter whether you eat like, you know, one, two or three meals a day versus three five, six meals a day. And so, um, that's, that's kind of what it boils down to. It, it is a goal dependent thing to whether protein frequency through the day even really matters. And another thing, if I, if I may add in this wrinkle here, Sean, the multiple doses of protein a day thing, um, to maximize muscle growth, it might not matter much after three meals and up. And the, the only population for whom that might matter are like competitive bodybuilders who are trying to eke out the very last hypothetical um, amount of gains. And, you know, the difference in their growth could mean the difference in placing first or second, let's say. So yeah, very fringe kind of population for that. Yeah, I, I can tell you, you know, the, the one thing I, I, the curiosity I have is, you know, because I think most of those, again, multi-dose multi, multi -dose studies probably were done on things like isolates or whey protein, some, something like that. And I know what I'm digesting is steak. I'm absorbing more than 30 grams. I guarantee you that, that, that you know, 100 grams are in that steak, 70 of it's not going in the toilet. I don't think. I think it's, mm -hmm. our digestive system slows down. We, we you know, we, we basically... 
you know, so we can absorb majority of that. So the question is, you know, am I slowly, you know, getting this amino acidemia, uh, muscle protein synthesis? I don't know. I don't know. If it's gonna, I can tell you my, from my perspective, from my personal experience, again, this is anecdotal, what you say make is pretty much line. I can eat a bunch, a big meal and I'll, I'll maintain muscle mass, you know, but if I want to, if I want to put on size, which I really do at this age, and I'm not really interested in that. You know, I'm happy at 240 pounds. That's fine for me. I have to, I have to eat multiple times a day. It just works a little better for me. And, and, you know, the volume it takes to do that is tough to do in one meal anyway. Um, well, Sean, I, I want to point out that you, you raise an important concept because, um, some people do kind of mix up the, the whole idea about muscle maximizing muscle protein synthesis versus digesting and absorbing all of the, the protein dose. Right. So those are, those are kind of, those are definitely two different things. So if somebody ate a hundred grams of protein in, in the form of meat in a single sitting, they're going to digest and absorb just about all of it. Yeah. It's but not, the, the, that muscle protein synthesis side right. will could potentially be different with a different distribution of it. Yeah. We got to, we got to re refill our gut. I mean, our gut lining is sloughed off. We've got a lot of, a lot of reasons for protein outside of yeah. muscle protein synthesis, right? Organs, bones, That's right. All that That's stuff right. is in there. So, yeah, it's because, you know, people are worried. They're like, well, if I eat more than 30 grams of protein, it's being lost. But I said, well, the human species would have died. I, I would have been dead a long time ago because that would mean I'm absorbing, what, 120 calories or something like yeah. that. I'm like, I, I yeah. would never survive with that. You would have died of protein malnutrition a long time ago. Exactly. So let me ask you about, because uh, I, I, I know Brad, I'm also a fan of Brad, Brad Schoenfeld's work. Mm. What about exercise frequency? So that's part of the equation too. And I don't want to just solely focus on bodybuilding because I think there's some interesting stuff on the health side of things. But what what is the exercise? I, I know there was a recent systematic review or state of the art review on workout frequency and intensity and volume. Are, did you get into that any of that stuff, or is that part of your purview? Yeah, yeah. Um, which which uh, which systematic review are, are you talking about? Are you talking about one that? Uh, I think about mortality. No, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, I think it was a hypertrophy study. It was, it was mm. looking at, you know, it's like 10, 10 sets of volume a week at, you know, you, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but I yeah, can't yeah, yeah. It. Um, there's a bunch of those. Um, so as far as like volume goes set volume per week, uh, there, there appears to be a, uh, population dependent effect. So with, uh, with new trainees, with newbie trainees, they seem to do just fine on, on, on pretty low volumes. Like we're talking five ish a week, um, up to 10 and after 10 sets per muscle group per week, uh, the, it's just a bunch of gray area. We really don't quite know what, what's going to maximize muscle growth after 10 sets per muscle group per week. But, um, when we put together the little circumstantial evidence, little bits and pieces, it kind of comes down to potentially 10 to 20 ish sets per muscle group per week in advanced trainees who are trying to push the envelope. Um, with me personally, I, I don't like to be in the gym for like, you know, <laughs> two hours at a time. And uh, I found that uh, I, my, personal sweet spot with set volume per week is right about like eight to uh, on and seasonally up to 12 sets per muscle group per week. And um, I'm good with that. I can keep my training sessions down to under an hour and I can train each muscle group twice a week and I can be just fine with about four days a week ish of, uh, of resistance training. So it, it, that, works out fine for me volume wise guys who are running, you know, more than 15 and certainly up to 20 sets per muscle group per week. They're, they're in the gym for, you know, more than an hour at a time, 90, 90 ish minutes at a time. And, or they're in the gym five, six days a week. And not everybody can maintain that. It's not a realistic thing. Lifestyle wise. Yeah. I, that's probably far more than I do. I don't even do, I don't think I even do as much as that. I probably three three sets a week but i mean usually that's it's fairly intense stuff but i and, and again my goal is not to put on size it's basically just to maintain and be functional you said i know you're recently you're kind of i'm 55 i know you're you're somewhere in that 
you know, 50 ish range. Now I think you said just past 50. And so I, I just, yeah, I just crossed over. Well, congratulations. I didn't know you were 55. You look yeah. amazing, dude. Yeah, 55. But I mean, I, uh, um, one of the things I saw you commenting is you said you're, you feel better than you did. You're maybe more muscle than you had earlier. What are you doing different now that, that you obviously you study this, so you've got the science to figure out what, what works for you. <laughs> um, uh, a big part, honestly, Sean, is I, I stopped drinking in 2018. Uh, I, I used to drink like a true, like a true Elvis, you know. <laughs> um, but but yeah, so almost four years, not a drink, be- better recovery, better training, better sleep. Um, I've and I've always been into to working out and lifting and the whole whole uh, gym culture, physique culture. So I, I had a an advantage going in since I I've been training since my, uh, late teens and picked that up from, from my dad after he gave me the first, uh, set of dumbbells, you know, can we talk about, I mean, maybe I don't know, let me know if this is within your, your realm here, but, but, uh, the benefits of strength on, on, or, or body composition and its effect on disease, perhaps longevity, mortality. Are you familiar with any mm-hmm. of the research on that? And can you speak to that? Yeah. 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 There, there seems to be two camps. Um, and two lines of thinking as far as um, lifting and body comp and longevity. So the conventional, or I, I just call them the longevity community, because there really is kind of only one set of squeaky wheels who um, is pushing a, a, a bunch of recommendations that I disagree with. So with the conventional line of thinking, they push protein restriction. And they push the limiting of resistance training, just keep it low intensity, moderate intensity at most, and keep it at a low roar. And they also, on top of that, they push calorie restriction. So <laughs> honestly, I, I mean, you put all those things together and you don't have a very high defense against the development of frailty. And you don't have a very high defense against the development of sarcopenia. Um, and then there's a, there's a related phenomenon that, that isn't as, as well known. It's called dynopenia. So sarcopenia is age related muscle loss, muscle mass loss and dynopenia, um, for the listeners is age related loss of muscle strength. So, um, it, it, it's pretty incredible how these concepts just keep getting recycled through the aging community. Uh, or through the longevity community to the point where nobody's lifting that much, that hard, that intensely, nobody's optimizing their protein intake. And uh, consequently, nobody's really even coming close to uh, um, max- maximizing their potential for, for muscle gain. Um, and that's a super important thing for older adults, because when you think about muscle tissue as the body's metabolic engine or metabolic furnace and, and muscle mass is crucial for the metabolism at the, at the systemic level of metabolic fuels. Um, it's just insane really to me to think that people are downplaying the importance of, of, uh, maintaining muscle mass as you age. And of course you, you've heard Sean, the, the, uh, the theories, um, surrounding why, have to do with these, these micro mechanisms where the, these guys have made these Superman sized leaps of logic that, okay, well, um, protein increases IGF one and mTOR. And and we don't want that because that, that can shorten the lifespan of, of, uh, yeast and flies and worms. (laughs) It's like, good gracious. It's, it's like, it's almost like focusing on um, a single hormone as a result of macronutrient consumption and say, okay, we have to avoid the elevation of this particular hormone. Otherwise this effect is going to happen with body composition. It's, it's kind of in the same realm of, of ill logic. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree with that. I mean, and, and you know, you, you insulin, you know, it's like people are hyper obsessed about insulin. It's something we need. We have to have it. It's, it's there for a reason. And to it may be bad in a certain situation where it's chronically always stimulated. Same thing with IGF, same thing with mTOR, but there's reasons for it to be there. And there's, there's times when it needs to be done. And I think, I don't know if you're familiar with Keith Barr. I know Keith Barr's done some research 
I think he's out of UC Davis. I had a long, a nice discussion with him about this concept of stimulating mTOR appropriately, inappropriately. You know, they give these uh, animals a rapamycin, they all become sarcopenic. You know, it just globally shuts down synthesis and they become frail. And that is a significant problem, you know, and it's becoming more and more a problem. But but yet this still persists. And I, I you know, we see this. Uh, is there any human data? I know there's a study, Longo Levine study, looking at, uh, and I've, I know Don Lame and Stu Phillips have been very critical of the study that came out saying that in midlife, if humans consume cons- more protein, they're going to end up dying early or something like that. But in later life, it reverses, and it was kind of a butchering of the NHANES data, I believe. Do you? Mm-hmm. Is there any human? Yeah, yeah. Is there any human actual human data for these protein restriction guys? And what about caloric restriction? What? My my understanding is that it only applies in, when you're looking at obese populations. But what are your thoughts around caloric restriction and, and human data on protein? Yeah, yeah that that research that came out that that showed how um, lowered protein is is bad for folks sixty five uh, is good for folks six. Uh, okay, wait a minute. Let me let me reverse it. Higher protein is good for people sixty five and up, but then for people in in middle age. And younger, then um, uh, higher protein was was bad, and it sort of had this, this kind of dichotomous type of effect in those two two age groups. It, it that is a product of messy observational research that we just have to take with a grain of salt. Um, the the mechanisms just really aren't there; they're not strong enough. Uh, successful aging has everything to do with supporting as much as you can, the function of the musculoskeletal system and cardiometabolic health. So the way to do that is to make sure that within reason, you can optimize your body composition and optimize your, your physical functionality. And, um, Caloric restriction, moving on to that part of the question, it, caloric restriction per se on its own, it doesn't do jack. It has no inherent benefit other than alleviating a state of obesity um, or maintaining a, a pre existing state of leanness. And so once you're there, the, the recommendation to calorically restrict, 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 it doesn't make sense. Because once again, when you calorically restrict, you can compromise your um, nutritional status from just an essential nutrient perspective. And also from a a macronutritional perspective, for example, getting enough protein. So older adults, and certainly people who keep advancing in age towards elderly levels are notorious for not getting enough protein. And there's plenty of research looking at uh, the RDA level of protein, which is 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight, which is something like 40, 45, 55 grams in, in, in um, you know, typical adult. Plenty of research showing that that is just insufficient to optimize metabolic health. It's insufficient to optimize the retention of, of muscle mass, especially in the older population. So None of the conventional recommendations of the in quotes longevity community make sense. And uh, truly none of it is based on good human research. Yeah, I, uh, that, that's been my take on this. And I, you know, I, I, again, when I, when I hear people talking about longevity, I'm just like, do you get a money back guarantee or how do you know, because we see these people selling different optimization programs and I'm, I'm still yet to see i mean every person i've met that's been 100 years of old in my career has been some old lady that's been demented in a diaper with a broken hip and, and not doing well so i mean i'm not seeing 120 year olds walking around that are lean in shape mentally with it uh so you know again I, i'm i'm waiting for someone to prove that and i don't see that i mean the best i can say is kind of what you're you're saying let's preserve function lean mass you know strength uh, those types of things. It seems to make sense. And maybe, maybe, maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe we'll all be wrong, but, uh, maybe the, uh, frailty pro frailty guys will win in the end, but I don't know. That's a quality of life. I want to live regardless. <laughs> I tell you what, 
we'll be wrong and we'll we'll be able to stand up out of our chairs by ourselves. Yeah, that's true. Exactly right. Let's let's talk about some things that are a little more controversial. Now, you're in a group of people that just eat a bunch of meat. We're we're we're, we're pariahs, crazy people, right? We're just <laughs> we're just like, well, how dare you guys eat all this meat and 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 not eat you know a bunch of fiber and stuff like that? You know, I, I get it. It's very it's very uh, counterculture in this day and age. But if we look at like you know, let's say our goal is. Uh, preserving lean mass, preserving mm-hmm. function. How do we do that? What, I mean, just in a gl- general global sense, can I do that without eating bro- 12, you know, 12 cups of broccoli a day? What are your thoughts? Well, yeah, I, I'm the impact of, um, the impact of, of carbohydrate on, on muscle mass is, is more of a, a more of a permissive thing than, than, a, than a required thing. It's more of an efficiency thing. Um, there, there's a, there's a repetition of research showing that it it is kind of difficult to put on, to actually gain, um, body weight by eating just protein and fat mainly. So, and the reason why it's difficult is because protein is so satiating and there could even be, um, a long-term satiating effect of, uh, protein and fat. So, um, people just don't have the, the, <laughs> they're, they're just not physiologically driven to keep eating and, and, and keep overeating if, well, you know, frankly, if, if carbs are out of the equation. Um, and so if you, you know, you mentioned vegetables like broccoli and such, um, that's not going to have a meaningful, uh, effect one way or another uh, on muscle growth. It's just that. The research as we know it today shows that it's just difficult to overeat and run a meaningful caloric surplus if you're just eating protein and fat. Yeah, and that's the thing. I think if you look at some of the interplay between some of these satiety hormones, whether it's CCK or peptide YY or uh, I think it's uh, GLP-1, we see that maybe carbs have a better ability to, to, to inhibit those effects and therefore you can eat more. And you're, you're, I mean, I think most of us experience that, you know, you stuff yourself and you always got room for that piece of chocolate cake or, you know, I mean, you've got room for that stuff and it helps to, I agree. I mean, for me to put on weight, I've got to eat six pounds of frigging meat a day. I don't want to do that most days. I mean, that's, that's a challenge. I can do it a couple of days in a row, but beyond that, from a sustained day in and day out basis, you're pretty miserable. But if you look at some of these really big even the big bodybuilders, the big world strongest man competitor, they're, I mean, they're literally eating all day long. I mean, they're, it's not fun for them anymore because they're, they're constantly having to consume, you know, eight, 10,000 calories a day. And it's hard to do that without carbohydrates. I, I definitely would, would concur with that. Yeah. What about, yeah. um, so this is, and, and I want to get to your book here in a second, Alex, I, and I appreciate, you know, I'm actually looking forward to reading that. Um, oh, cool, cool. There is, uh, a lot of controversy around and, and you know uh, you know calories are the only thing that matters versus there's another camp that says it's all about insulin and the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis and there's probably in my in my my perspective i think there's some nuance there i mean certainly we know when we just look at protein you know that's that's a that that's kind of a special macronutrient and, and can you talk about there's a thermic effect is it's you know some people say it's around 25 percent. what does the research show about protein calories being you know i mean obviously caloric deficit but what's what drives like for instance caloric expenditure you know it's, it depends on the mm-hmm. temperature you know if it's hot out i'm gonna i don't need to generate as much body heat right so there's a lot of things that go into that yeah the whole calories in calories out thing um it's it's falsely pitted against hormones you know there, there's this false uh, battle that people put together when the reality is that they're, they're interconnected and they kind of puppeteer one another in, in a bi-directional sense. So it's a lot easier to think in terms of, okay, all that matters is hormones or all that matters is calories. When the reality is energy balance or relative state of energy balance, whether you're running a caloric surplus or a caloric deficit, um, this can greatly influence the, uh, the hormonal environment, the hormonal milieu. And, um, and it it can go vice versa as well. So like if somebody um, has low, low thyroid production, then that'll impact um, their energy balance. So it, it it works both ways and it works by, it works bi-directionally there. 
So um, if we could think of it like this, um, one of the, the false attributions of hormonal effect would a perfect example that you raised is insulin. So what causes a chronic elevation of insulin is eating too much <laughs> is chronically eating too chronically eating too much calories. And, um, if, you know, we can veer off into the weeds and some people say, well, calories don't exist. The body doesn't have any calorie receptors. Well, the body does have energy sensing uh, mechanisms at, at multiple levels. Um, you know, from, from mTOR to AMPK all the way to, to leptin being affected by body fat levels. I mean, there's short-term energy sensing mechaniz mechanisms in the body and long-term energy sensing mechanisms in the body. So yeah, the body in a way does has, have many ways to, to um, have some degree of awareness of, of caloric balance. So we can think of it like this. If we take a, um, a perfect archetypal example, like, like the ketogenic diet, or just let's say eating less than 10% of your calories from carbohydrate, or like with the carnivore community, that probably less than that, right? So what happens is satiety drives a lower intake of calories, that lower intake of calories, um, sets the body up physiologically for lower insulin levels, uh, both, you know, acutely and, and, and chronically. So, <laughs> you know, they, they affect each other and, and also calories will always matter. If you look at studies that examine the effects of keto on body weight and body composition, the well-designed studies will, will, always find almost without a doubt when, when you set a group up to just go keto, but don't restrict, don't, don't consciously restrict calories, just eat what we call ad libitum, eat ad libitum as you wish, but just protein and fat. What happens is when they switch over from their baseline habitual diet to the ketogenic diet, they end up eating about four to 900 calories less per day on average as a result to switching to keto. And, you know, the mechanisms behind that are probably mainly a satiety thing, um, probably a lowering of the palatability of the diet, a lowering of the opportunity to eat offending foods and food concoctions and um, hyper palatable carb fat combo foods. Um, so, so yeah, a lot, what a lot of people don't realize is when, when somebody goes keto from a baseline of the standard American diet, they do end up eating substantially less calories per day. And it's not, a, it's not necessarily a mechanism of, okay, well, their hormonal environment changed and that's why they lost weight. Well, they lost weight because they're eating the equivalent of like a one less large meal a day than they used to. Can you think of a, I mean, and just, just think, think of protein in here. Can you think of an equation where uh, I was eating a diet where I was eating 2,000 calories a day at weight maintenance, and then I increased my caloric to 2,200 or 2,300 calories a day, and I still lost weight? You know, can you, could you design that diet where maybe, maybe we really went heavy on the protein relative to where we were before? Could we see that potentially happening? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so that's a whole different thing. Um, you like an increase in protein. To, to, in attempt to, to create a caloric surplus, uh, there's a series of studies that have been done five, at least five studies now, uh, done, done by my, my colleague, Joey Antonio. Um, and what they've done is they've taken subjects and on top of their habitual dietary, these are, um, young, relatively fit resistance training subjects. Um, they've basically added anywhere from hundred to close to 200 grams of protein on top of their pre-existing uh, dietary habits. So you know, like four, yeah. yeah, four to 800 calories extra in the form of protein, just stacked on top of what they normally eat. And in free living conditions, 
this, it's, there's a fascinating consistency of this extra protein <clears throat> pretty much just disappearing. So their baseline protein intakes have been pretty high because this is, you know, athletic, um, athletic population. So they're already consuming about a gram per pound of body weight in protein. And then when about 100, 150, sometimes 200 grams of protein in some studies were added on top of that, nothing happened, man, with, with body composite. No fat was gained. No muscle was gained either. Uh, the four to 800 calories just seems to disappear, in quotes, disappear. My thought on how that happens is that, uh, number one, thermogenesis or caloric burn ramps up somehow by maybe a number of, of pathways. Um, it, it's possible that active energy expenditure could spontaneously go up. So purposeful movement and training and, and, and training performance could go up and certainly uh, work volume would go up alongside the increase in um, protein intake. And then uh, potentially uh, resting energy expenditure could go up and also um, non-exercise energy expenditure could go up as well. So the, the whole NEAT phenomenon, so that would stand for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So when you're like sitting around fidgeting or when you're like, <laughs> you know, tossing and turning in bed, even um, non-exercise activity spontaneously and subconsciously that could ramp up when you increase your protein intake. And then the third major mechanism that would be driving the disappearance of these extra protein calories would be an increase in satiety or, or a decrease in hunger that would spontaneously drive down the intake of your other macronutrients, carbohydrate and fat, uh, when you increase protein. So in free living conditions, this seems to be what happens pretty consistently. So if, if somebody were to try to gain weight on just protein, it would be very, very difficult to do that. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that's really interesting. I think it's fascinating that, that, that the calories almost kind of disappear in that regard. So that's why when people say, well, I ate more calories, but their protein went up dramatically. I'm thinking this is what's going on, even though like I'm eating more, but yeah, but you're, most of it's protein. And so you're, you're probably somehow it's, it's sort of doing what you're saying, disappearing. Let's talk about, um, I, I saw just randomly things here. I saw a post the other day. There's a, there's a belief, there's this demonization of what is causing everybody to be sick and fat is it sugar. Is it fat? Is it saturated fat? And is it polyunsaturated fatty as seed oils, you know, the industrial seed oils and everybody says, and you, you put something together, I think about that. So what does the data show around these, uh, these oils that are in the diet now, the modern diet, which, you know, arguably, I mean, not arguably, I mean, clearly we're not part of the diet 200 years ago. And I, I look at the fact that they're almost always in this processed food. I mean, this is where most people are consuming the soybean oil and the, the, the it's always seems to be associated with those things. So what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. The, the controversy about seed oils, um, is, is, you know, it is twofold. I, I think, um, kind of an over generalization that a lot of people make when they say just seed oils are bad, all of them are bad, you know, kick them out, avoid them. Um, well, that's, that's not true because, um, hydrogenated vegetable oils are the ones that, that cause the measurable harm at, at the intermediate endpoint level. And also at the hard endpoint level, like the disease and mortality, intermediate endpoints being different blood markers of, uh, uh, blood biomarkers of, of health, like the lipids yeah. and such. So um, not all seed oils have those kind of, uh, in quotes, evil effects. Um, what really, like I said, what really is the culprit are hydrogenated vegetable oils and hydrogenated uh, meaning made more, made engineered to be more solid and spreadable and shelf stable. And also, uh, the vehicles that these seed oils are present in. So the food matrix of, uh, 
let's say a donut. <laughs> I mean, that vehicle is the one that's gonna gonna do you in. It's not necessarily the seed oils per se. It's what they're packaged in. And um, there is a whole debate um, around the seed oils thing, but the the data being used to support the idea that seed oils are just inherently bad is pretty weak compared to uh, the data supporting the vehicles of the seed oils really being the issue. So when people avoid seed oils, they end up avoiding these hyper palatable junk foods along with the seed oils. And so that has the much bigger impact. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no one is, I don't think anyone is really like drinking canola oil out of the bottle. I mean, I mean, maybe a few people are, but I mean, there's some, there's always some crazy people. Out there. Hey, let me ask. So I am obviously clearly, clearly biased. My bias, I don't want the world turning into a bunch of vegans. I just don't think that's a good, good thing for humanity. And so when we look at, you know, comparing, you know, different sources of protein, right? I mean, it's serious, but I mean, it's funny, but we look at different sources of protein, plant protein versus animal protein. I know there's some studies out there showing that, you know, you can construct a plant protein isolate diet where you get an equivalent muscle protein synthesis response. Mm -hmm. That that's been that's been shown, and and they'll. But let me ask you about this. So, and I, I got a little thumbs up from you on the, one of the posts I had. There's studies showing that cholesterol has an anabolic effect, and mm -hmm. we don't get cholesterol from plants. We only get it from animal products. So, wh what do you think? What do you think the relative effect is of, of cholesterol on this valuable thing we call retention of lean mass and muscle protein synthesis or building muscle? You, you, you know, you talk about about vegans. I I, I have to laugh because. You and I both have friends who are vegans. Yeah, right. I mean, longtime friends who are vegans who we would still save from a burning building despite their veganness. <laughs> yeah. <that's true>. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we know them and, and we love them, but we'll still eat, we'll still eat eggs. We'll still eat our whole eggs and egg yolks and stuff. Um, cholesterol has an, an, an interesting effect on testosterone. So um, there's a recent study, I think it could be by Van Vliet uh, and colleagues, but they took a look at the effects of whole eggs versus egg whites mm -hmm. on um, muscle protein synthesis. And then they did a follow-up study where they actually looked at the effect of whole eggs versus egg whites on uh, body composition and, and strength. And so the whole eggs, basically, they had superior effects on, on um a, a bunch of the outcomes there. And it may not have been statistically significant in one of them, but still there, it leaned towards um, eating whole eggs, but a little detail that uh, a lot of people miss in, in that research is in the, in the, in the study that didn't just look at the short-term post-exercise effect of egg yolks versus egg whites. The one that looked at three eggs a day for um, several weeks, testosterone increased substantially, um, well, substantially anyway, from, from a food mediated increase, I think it, I think it went up even if I'm not mistaken, it was something between maybe two to 300 nanograms per deciliter. Uh, I, I have to relook that up, but I, I looked at the increase in testosterone in the egg yolk group. And then I'm like, damn, that's pretty cool. I think it's time. <laughs> I think it's time to have some egg yolks right now. So, um, so yeah, the effect of egg yolks on, on testosterone is, is pretty profound and it is because of the cholesterol content. Um, and so there is, there is something to be said about, about that. Uh, of course, everybody's afraid of the effect of cholesterol on blood lipids and, and the whole kind of con conventional line of thinking of the development of, of where that goes. But, um, I, I personally like eggs. They don't personally uh, affect my my blood lipids adversely. But then again, my lifestyle doesn't necessarily leave room for something like a few a few eggs a day to 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 impact me my health uh, adversely. So I, I'm personally not worried about it. Yeah, and I you know I think you, you may be aware the Dietary Guidelines Committee in 2015 said cholesterol is no longer a nutrient of concern, and so now it's you know as far as raising these intermediary, intermediary biomarkers, LDL cholesterol in particular, doesn't seem to do that, or at least that's what, what the claim was. 
And, you know, Vince Garanda, I'm sure you may be familiar with this. He used to advocate yeah. for 36 eggs a day as a anabolic part of the diet. And, and I've eaten a lot of it. I mean, some days I'll eat freaking 18 eggs, sometimes 24 eggs in a day. I mean, I put it down with, because that's where all my calories are coming from. And I'm not, you know, and it's not even that many calories when you add it up. I mean, um, the, what's I going to get at here? Let's talk about your book, Alan. I'll give you some time to chat about that because we're running out of time. Tell me about the, when's the book coming out or has it been released yet? What does it, what does it cover? What's the name of it? Where can we get it? All those types of things. It's called, it's mis, it's mistitled flexible dieting. (laughs) I I say mistitled flexible dieting because I, I just, I was given the opportunity to write a nutrition book. And so since I, I, academically came up in the nutrition track. So I got my undergrad in nutrition. I got my graduate degree in nutrition as well. There was no good book on nutrition that talked about nutrition's impact on body composition and athletic performance. So I I just wanted to cover that and and write that book. um, Victory Belt approached me to write the the book on flexible dieting because I was one of the guys who <clears throat> brought the concept into the, the the mainstream right the the whole if it fits your macros thing that morphed into a monster where people were just eating pop darts and, and whey protein and calling it a day uh, unfortunately me and a couple other guys we're credited for that but <laughs> I'm gonna you know. We, that wasn't really, that actually wasn't what we wanted to happen. But anyways, that, that's a whole other, that's a whole other story. But yeah, man, um, my book is pretty much everything you need to know about nutrition, uh, as it affects body composition and athletic performance. Uh, I spent six weeks with a, a software developer helping, um, him, take the the formulas I developed to determine caloric needs, macronutrient needs uh, into an online calculator. The link to that is in the book, but really anybody who's just interested in, in nutrition, I, I I think I wrote the the big daddy book of, of uh, nutrition. I, I I set aside two years. I had no freaking life for two years. I, I neglected my, my, uh, my husbandly and fatherly duties for like two years straight. So please make it worth it. And, you know, please get the book. (laughs) And uh, yeah, it's coming out June 5th and I've gotten some pretty major raves for it, man. And uh, I, I, geez, I I really need to get a copy in your hands. You might be too dangerous with, with my book in your hands. (laughs) No, I'd love to read it. I I really, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And I, and I appreciate the fact, you know, how, how you come out, like, and I've had this happen to me where you come out with a sort of a concept and then people distort it and they misrepresent Mm -hmm. it. And, you know, you get people eating, well, you know, I could eat pop tarts and, you know, all this garbage and, and still, you know, and, and at the end of the day, I mean, that's not what your intention was. Your intention was probably, I think, well, I don't know. I, I'll let you speak to your own intentions on this stuff. But my my goal is not to everybody really turn into zealot, crazy vegetables are evil and bad. It, it was never my intention. But some people have turned turned it, turned it into that. I, I think the same things happen with the, if it fits your macros or flexible dieting thing. And I think it's unfortunate when... I think at the end of the day, we're trying to get people healthier or we'd like to because our government's not doing a very good job. I'll, I'll, I'll delve into politics a little bit in here, but I'm just thinking I don't care who the president is or God, the mission wants to be. Let's not so have so many damn sick, obese, disabled, mentally crazy people. But anyway. Uh, I, I live in California, so yeah. I feel you on the government dropping the ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, 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 what part of California are you in, Alan? Southern California, L.A. County. Okay. Okay. I, I live in Orange County for a while. We just moved up to, to, to the Seattle area. I'm actually going to be in Laguna Beach uh, in about two weeks. So be in, that, oh, cool. in your neck of the woods. But awesome. All right. Well, so Victory and yeah, Victory Belts for my book was published as well. Um, any last yeah. words? We got about we got about three four minutes before I got to go jump on and do some stuff, do some consults and stuff. But any last things you want to share with us? Any pearls or tips or wisdoms? Well, I maybe a couple comments. Um, I, man, 
with you giving the information you you give and taking the position that you take, you get a surprisingly low amount of of hate and trolling. <laughs> like, how is that? I mean, do people just is? Uh, I couldn't imagine your your page being that heavily moderated. Is it just people just don't want to go there? They don't want to enter the, the the lion's den. What is it? I think. Yeah, that might be that it's gotten to be a point where it's, you know, I, you know, because, you know, and obviously people, particularly people that have a, a sort of a vegan ideology, hate the fact that I tell people to eat meat. They think it's awful, you know, and it's it's terrible. I get a very small percentage of that. And I've just turned it around and to turn it into humor. I mean, I just kind of, I just kind of use it to use it as more fun, you know, and I think they don't want to be part of that anymore. And so I, early on I, I got it and I used to engage with these folks. And then I just, I would just ask them, I said, Hey, if you had to eat a piece of meat to save you or your kid's life from some horrible disease, would you do it? And and that was just the ethical question. It was just like, it was, am I dealing with a sane person or an, an insane person? And then when they realized that that was a question that was before them, they either go away or they, they either make some because you can't really answer that question, you know, no, I wouldn't. And I'd let my kids suffer or yes, I would. Then you're not really committed to your, your, your sort of religion. So it's kind of a nice discriminating uh, thing, but I get, I get, I get, a, I get a fair amount in the, in the, in the direct messages, but uh, you know, it's, 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 it's you get actually, some venom, you get some vitriol. I get a little bit, but I, I would say really, honestly, about 99% of what I get is, uh, um, uh, positive. I mean, I do get some, you know, fo folks from, from, from sort of your camp. Well, you need to eat carbs to put on muscle. And I'm saying, well, you know, Hey, it's fine. If you want to do it, I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm just saying, I, this is what I prefer. This is how I feel better. And thankfully I live in a country where I'm allowed to eat what I want, at least for now. I mean, who knows if that's going to be the case. And I think if we don't as a community you know, collectively, you know, defend that right. I, and like I said, I would defend the right of any vegan to eat a vegan diet. Yeah, I may think it's silly and goofy, but I I, I encourage you to be allowed to do that. And and I think that's uh, that's a little bit different here because there's other people I don't think they would afford that same, uh, you know, grace to me, you know, and, and they would say, well, we think you should just eat, you know, bean curds and stuff like that. And I'm you know, not <laughs> you, interested. You know, what's, what, what's super hilarious, Sean, is my first interaction with you online was you were doing a, an Instagram live and I was just trying to troll you, uh, um, not maliciously, but I said something to the effect of about pizza or something. I can't remember what it yeah, was or something yeah, like that. It was, yeah. Yeah. It's like, I said, Hey, Sean, I just ate a large order of fries. <laughs> Am I going to live through this? <laughs> and your response was, was funny. It was great. I, I mean, you took it really well and, um, you know, it was, just, it, it's, pretty funny how that that was our our first interaction and actually i was excited to see you in there because i like i said alan i've known about you for years and I, I i really i mean like as crazy as i seem i'm i think i'm somewhat reasonable and i, I you know i've tried to follow follow the quote the science to the best of my ability and maybe i maybe i don't like to eat a lot of vegetables but hey that's just that's just my weirdness but i think the rest of it is not not too too crazy i suppose well i think that the conversation is important i think yeah. the diversity of ideas is important. I think that it's important to be able to let the, you know, the extreme sides, let's see carnivore and vegan. Yeah. I think it's important for them to hash out what is, you know, what their positions are and, and, and people should be able to communicate like that without just hating each other. Right. And you so. learn things on the extremes. I mean, this is where these like, you know, Jose Antonio extreme outliers and diet, you will hate a minute. We could eat 200 extra grams of protein a day and don't gain anything. Yeah. I mean, the, the, these people that are willing to do extreme things kind of teach us some things. And I don't, you know, I think, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, and I don't know anybody's ever saying we all need to be doing this. I, I've never said that. And you won't ever hear me saying that, but I think it's something we can, we can certainly learn from. And anyway, I got to go. It's been a pleasure. Alan. look forward to talking to you down the road again, if you don't mind, I'd love to, you know, cause there's so many more topics we could get into. I'm sure that you're a wealth of knowledge and thanks for doing what you do. And you go buy the book. Flex, it's called what again? Flexible. It's called flexible dieting. Flexible dieting. Yeah. Go check yeah. it out guys. Victory belt. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Alan, thank you. Hey everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you so much, Sean. Okay. Bye-bye guys.